As you're turning there, I want to speak to your mind for a moment. Take your mind back to John 18, not Luke 16, but just your mind. As we turn to Luke 16, to John 18, what is happening is Pilate is trying the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is on trial in John 18. He understands that the Jews have brought him there and their desire is for him to be crucified. They have yelled, uh, they have screamed their desires for crucifixion, crucifixion. Their desire was that he would be lifted up on a tree because that would be cursed of God. And They just didn't know the picture that Christ was trying to be cursed for our sake so he wouldn't have to be cursed from God. And Pilate looks at these Pharisees, these Jewish leaders, and he begins to ask them what is the accusations against Christ. And they begin to tell him what is their accusations. And the Bible says in Matthew's account that he knew for envy they had brought him there. So he hears something from them that he understands that is probably not true, at least not full truth. And so he goes into the Lord Jesus Christ and he begins to interrogate him and really ask him the question about what is the truth. And in doing so, he wants to understand what is his judgment on this decision. What is his judgment on this call? And he will look at the Lord Jesus Christ and ask this question, what is truth? Have you ever thought that same question? What is truth? You know, from generation to generation, we've all kind of wondered, what is the real truth? What is truth? Uh, I believe with all of my heart that we live in a world that has so many things going on. There's so many uh, uh, people speaking into our, our, our ears to what truth may be to them or what truth may be to some religious port person or what is true to this uh, intellectual person. You see, science tells us something and uh, Popular culture tells us something and so many oftentimes we find ourselves just following that as truth. We believe that or we accept that as the truth. But then the question comes to our mind, what is truth? What is truth? How many could answer the question this morning, uh, how many planets are in our solar system? How many could help me out with that? Anybody help me with our planets? Yes, Miss Brittany? Oh, well, we have two different answers. Brittany says eight. Patty says nine. Now, what's the true answer? What is truth? What, well, what, well, when I was in school, I went to science class, and I learned that there were nine planets in orbit of our sun. Did anybody else go to, go to, go to school like that? I did. And we, we learned this uh, neat little saying to try to organize them. It, it went like this. My very educated mother just served us Nine what? Pizzas. Praise the Lord for pizza. Amen. You know, everything can be brought full circle back to food, right? Praise the Lord for pizza. But if a child goes to school now, they're not taught that there are nine planets because there are different classifications. They say, well, we've learned new truths. We've, we've learned new discoveries. We've, we've come to different places. So what you learned as truth in when the days that you went to school is no longer truth anymore. It's changed. There is a, a different truth today than there was yesterday. And I don't know about you, but I would a whole lot rather have pizza than my very... Uh, what is it? Educated, thank you. Mother just served us noodles, okay? If you're going to get rid of a planet, don't get rid of the one that stands for pizza. But that makes me scratch my head just like Pilate. And here's the question that comes to my mind. What is truth? If they're going to change truth from this day to the next day and many things, not just the planets, but there's many things that they taught me when I was a child that they say in our day and in this hour, we become a little bit more educated. We become a little bit more knowledgeable and those things that used to be true are now false and today there is a different truth. Let me say that makes me question and ponder everything I know and I need to understand what is truth? What is truth? The truth. Do you realize that for thousands of years, the world's most educated men thought that the world sat on a large planet? That was 1500 B.C. That was what they taught to their people. Yet the Bible told us thousands of years before that, in Job 26, in verse number 7, he says this, He, being God, hangs the earth upon nothing. 
You see, the world system taught that the, the world was carried by some large animal, but, the, world, uh, but the, the Word of God, the Bible taught that thousands of years before that, the free-floating nature of earth in space. Do you realize that for, for many, many years they taught that the world was, was flat? Yet it was Christopher Columbus who looked upon the portions of the word, word of God where it says in Isaiah chapter number 40 and verse number 22, it is he that sits upon the circle of the earth. That word circle in the Hebrew language means a sphere. And so while educators was teaching that the world is flat and don't go so far, you might fall off of it. That's what they was teaching in the public school systems. Yet the word of God told us the real truth that there was a circle or a sphere to the earth. Not, that doesn't just stop there. Yet uh, there was a time when we didn't know what it was to have uh, the, uh, the currents of air, the cycle of air. Yet Solomon described thousands and thousands of years before that the, 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 the circle, the, circle the, the currents of air. He says this in Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, verse number 6, the wind goes towards the south and turns about into the north. It whirls about continuously and the wind returns according to its circuits. Now listen, the Bible gives so many facts that science will not accept until they finally come to the place where it smacks them in the face and they have to admit that's the truth. That's the truth. And so I want us this morning to understand that as the world continues to try to push agendas and teaches us, and listen, the world today is filled with confusion. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. They don't, we don't accept the truth as truth anymore. Listen, the Bible says that he created them male and female. That's the truth. That's, that's the options. There are no choice of that. God chooses that for us. And in a world filled with confusion, I hope and my prayer is that you understand that your desire is to find out what is the truth from God's Word. Amen. What is the truth that was revealed? I, I, I think of my, to myself, the Bible shows us in Psalms 100 and verse number 5, the Bible says this, The Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. You see, the Bible says that His truth, His truth will be present, it will endure to all generations. I praise the Lord. What is that, Brother Tommy? You're holding it in your lap, aren't you? It is the truth of the Word of God. The Bible says this in Psalm, or John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy what? Word is truth. Sanctify them, cleanse them, redeem them, separate them, create in them a holy nature. Why? Because your word is truth. This morning, I just want us to look at Luke chapter number 16. And I want us to divide the truth that is found in these passages. I want to preach on this subject this morning. Give me the truth. Give me the truth. How many want the truth? How, does anybody want to be lied to? Or do we all want to know what is the truth, Brother Tommy, from the Word of God? It's all through the Word of God. We're going to jump into Luke chapter number 16 because I believe that's God's focus for us this morning. Luke chapter number 16, I want us to look in verse number 19. The Bible says this. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Being in torments, and seeth of Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Again, we're going to be preaching on this subject. Give me the truth. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your many blessings. God, I ask that you would please bless the reading of your word today. God, we ask that you would divide to every heart what is truth. Lord, help us to put and filter everything that the world tells us through the word of God. God, help us to always come back to the Bible, Lord, because we know everything in opposition to the Bible is opposition to truth. 
And God, we're so thankful that you've proved yourself, you've proved your word so many times in our life. Lord, not just by what you reveal to our hearts, but the truth that you give, even in nature itself. God, I'm so thankful for the facts of the Bible. God, before man believed it, you knew it. You created it. And God, I ask that you'd help us to know truth about what it is in our lives today. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for everything that's said and done. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Number one, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. For the lost, there is a place, a true place, called hell. There is a true place called hell. We read in verse number 23, the Bible says, And in hell, this place, this literal place, this rich man, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, the world around us will teach us, and he will try to convince us that hell is not a real place. They will try to convince people all across this nation and against this world. They will teach us that uh, hell is a place that is in the imaginations of preachers. It's in the fantasy of a word called the Bible. It's, it's something that is made up to scare people into trying to be moral in their lives. But my friend, upon the authority of the Word of God and upon authority of God's holy Word, we understand that there is a truth and the truth is that there is a very real place called hell. There's a very real place called hell. In the same book, that has proven itself over and over and time and time again in which men finally have to come to the true discoveries that it actually was right. I say, my friend, they, they say that there's no hell, but one day there will be a reality to that. Can I, I, I think to myself, there, there was probably someone walking around in that day saying, no, the earth is flat. I know what the Bible says. It says it's a sphere, but no, it's flat. It's flat. It's flat. Oh, it really is a sphere. Okay. There it is. And can I say there's people walking around today saying, the Bible says that there's a place called hell, but there's no hell. There's no hell. There's no hell. I'm not trusting in Jesus Christ. I'm not turning to him. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to find hope from some book because there is no literal place called hell. And if they never turn, if they never repent, if they never get their sins covered by the precious blood of the Lamb, what I'm here to say is they will one day wake up just like this rich man and their eyes will look up towards heaven and say, you were right, God. There is a place called hell. I finally find in the word of God that there is a great truth and that truth is that there is a place, a true place called hell. And I want this morning to answer some questions about this place called hell that God gives us answers to. First, I want you to write this down. Why hell? Why is there a place where it is torments all day? Why is this place called hell? Well, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter number Matthew chapter number 25 and verse number 41, everlasting fire, speaking about hell, prepared, listen, who, for what? The devil and what? His angels. Prepared for the devil and his angels. You know what the Bible shows us there? The Bible shows us God's word, Jesus Christ, actually says that this place was created for one purpose. This place was prepared for, for one person group, and it was for the devil and his angels. You see, the devil as that uh, Lucifer, that, that angelic being, thought that himself that I want to rise myself above God. I, I want to be God, and he began to reject God and everything that he taught. And because of that, like a lightning bolt, he fell from heaven. The Bible says that he took a third of the angels with him and therefore God had this place created, this place prepared called hell to be a torment for that place. The reason why hell is because they rejected God. But can I say to you today, when Adam and Eve walked in that garden in the cool of the day, they went by that tree and Eve partook of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil against God's will. And Adam, knowing what she had just done, says, I will take it with you. And he chose to sin. And because of that one man's sin, Romans chapter number 5, verse number 12, tells us that sin passed to all men for that all men have sinned. The Bible tells us because of that sin, we have chosen a nature against that which is of God. We have turned our backs on God. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that sin, there's a place called hell. Not prepared for you, but you will end up there if you never trust in Jesus Christ to be as in faith to cover the sin that you've committed. Can I say there is the why of hell, but can I say what is the what of hell? 
What is it? What, what, is, what is hell? Jesus gives us a great picture here in our verses. Look at verse number 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Being in what? Torments. Being in torments. Can I say it is a place of torments? The Bible says in Psalms 11, verse number 6, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fires, and brimstone, and, and horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. You know what I, I find in the scripture? Is that this place of, uh, called hell is a place of outer darkness. It is a place of eternal torments. A place where the wicked shall burn forever. It's a place of torments. I notice in our scripture that this rich man, listen up folks, listen up. That rich man looked at Lazarus across this great gulf that was fixed and he saw the pleasures of this man of God living in the bosom of the man of God and he looked up and he didn't desire riches and he didn't desire anything he he desired but one thing and that was but a, a drop of water because of the torments of this place called hell not only to find what is hell and is a place of torments but it's a place without mercy the Bible says this and Mark chapter number 9 and verse number 44, where, is the, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's a place of torments. It's a place without mercy. It's something that never gets quenched. The fire it never goes out. The worm, the body never dies. It just continually dies and never, never finds relief. It's a place of torments. It is a place of without mercy. Can I say this? Hell is a place with memory. We'll find out later in this verse, verse number 25, that Abraham will look at this rich man and says, says these two words, Son, remember. You know what he was saying? He was saying this. He was telling to this rich man, he said, Son, I want you to remember some things. In your life, you had the opportunity to turn to Jesus, to trust in Jesus, to repent of your sins, to take the blood of a lamb and apply it to your life, but you never did. And I believe one of the worst things in this place called hell is a place, it's a place of torments the watts of hell because it is a place where our memory is always thinking of every time I sat in a church service heard the gospel preached heard the invitation given heard a preacher say come would you come and trust Jesus and I never did what a what a place of outer darkness what a place called hell but can I say when is hell look at verse number 22 the Bible says and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried. When is hell? The Bible tells us that when a person dies, when they come from, the, from death to life, when they breathe their last breath, there's no a grave sleep, there's no, nothing of this nature. It says that when a saint dies, they are immediately into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be unto God. But when a sinner dies, they immediately are taken to this place called hell where this rich man found himself. And at that time of his death, he looked up, the Bible says, being in hell time of his death and you say to myself you say to yourself well brother Tommy that's that's a relief because you know I'm not saved I don't know Jesus Christ me my personal savior I, I don't know where I'd go if I I die today but praise God I'm not dying today hold up hold up because the Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 27 verse number one boast not thyself for tomorrow for we don't know what a day may bring forth what is the truth, Brother Tom? Here's the truth. Every person needs to filter this through their mind and through their heart. There's a very real place, a place called hell. Next, I want you to notice there's two people in this story, not only Lazarus, but who's the second person we find? I'm sorry, not only a rich man, I answered the question, <laughs> but Lazarus. So we find a good place or a, a bad place, if you would, for this rich man, it's uh, showing us the, the life of a sinner, the, the condemnation, the damnation of a sinner, that there is a real place called hell. But we find this man named Lazarus, and he was a child of God, wasn't he? In his death, he was carried by the angels. Praise be unto God. The rich man died and was buried. But listen, Lazarus died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, to a place of paradise. But I want us to understand, here's the truth of this. Number two, write this down. For the saved, there is a true problem called affliction. There is a true problem called affliction. 
We look at these two men's lives and we say, you know, if I had to be one over the other, I would probably rather be Lazarus because uh, the rich man died and went to hell and Lazarus died and went to paradise. But really, Brother Tommy, when I look at his life, it's nothing that I would really ever desire. He, he is living a life of suffering. He is living a life of pain. And he is living a life of affliction. Can I ask you a question? How many has ever come to the realization that life is filled with affliction? Has anybody ever come to that realization? Every day that we live, we understand that we are living in a sin-cursed world with a flesh-driven nature that always brings us about to destruction. There is always something in us that hurts. There's problems that always come. I believe that many people come to the, real, or the, the thought that if, you know, if I just get saved, if I just come to God, then all of my problems would be over. And I say, uh-uh. Your greatest problem would be over. Your sin debt, the, the penalty that you have between you and God, that separation between you and God would be paid for. Praise be unto God. You would be a child of God. But can I say, your problems will still exist. I noticed through the scriptures that some of the greatest and godliest people that ever lived, that ever walked this planet, that gave their heart and their life to God, lived lives of affliction. Think about Joseph with me. Joseph was a young man and his heart was turned to God and God could speak with him and commune with him as friend with friend. And he told Joseph through visions as an early age that what will happen one of these days is uh, the, the stars will bow to you, the sun and the moon will bow to you. All of your sheep will be standing and everyone will be bowing. And he was showing Joseph, God was showing him that I'm going to use you in a great way. And I, can I say, because of salvation, that's what God has chosen for each person in here today. A great future. But what happened to Joseph immediately after the visions? What happened? Can I say, he went to his brethren and they hated him. Can I say, that's some pretty hard affliction, amen. amen. When the brethren hate you. And then they took him and they threw him into the pit. And eventually they will take him out and they will sell him into slavery. And Joseph works and works and he is a slave. And he is only at the, uh, the benefit of a master. And he is not living life like he wants to live. And he is living under the rule of someone else in great affliction. And finally he works his way up. And finally he ends up in this man named Potiphar's house. And he's finally getting to the place where he's over the estate of Potiphar. And he's living life of some substance finally and you know the story Potiphar's wife tries to get him to lie with her and he would not because he would not defile himself with against God and he says I will not she catches him by the coat he runs out there's a lie that's told on him Potiphar comes home and she says he tried to force himself upon me and he takes this young man that's trying to do his best to live and serve for God, being afflicted. And he takes him and throws him into prison. Listen, for several, several, several years, he was rotting in prison, in the inner dungeon. Can I say, that's a life of a person sold out to God sometimes. Right. We understand that God had a greater plan, didn't he? And all of this valleys that he was walking through and all of these hurts that he was walking through and this suffering and pain and affliction was taking him to a place where one day he would be the ruler of all the known world under Pharaoh. Amen. Can I say not only Joseph's life, but I think of a lady named Leah. Leah was the first wife of a man named Jacob. You remember the story? He says, Rebecca have I loved Leah have I what? Hated. I think of this woman named Leah and my heart breaks for her. She loved Jacob with such an intense love and all she wanted from him was some recognition that he loved her back yet she lived her entire life never finding the love of Jacob. Can I say sometimes for the believer there is a life of affliction. Have you ever felt that there was a mountain of problems and somehow you ended up right underneath it. Anybody ever felt that way? Ask old Job about that. You see, in the life of saints, the truth is, here's the truth. Sometimes there's the real problem of affliction. Brother Tommy, the truth don't sound so good right now. <laughs> Brother Tommy, lie to me tell me something I, I want to hear well listen I'm not going to lie to you but I'm going to tell you something that gets a whole lot better 
Because not only in this story do we find this torments of a place called hell, we find this uh, problem called the problem of affliction, but there is another person. <laughs> there is another person in Luke chapter number 16 that you may have never seen. Now, I'm not talking about Abraham. I'm talking about the great I am. I'm talking about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. My friends, what we find this morning is that there is truth that life has problems and life has its issues and with life comes hardships and, and troubles. But can I say, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ and he is there for you. In your affliction. I'm glad that in the middle of my affliction, I'm glad right smack dab in the middle of our separation of God stands a man named Christ Jesus spanning the gap between you and God. For your affliction or for your sin, He stands there. And I want us to understand that we could preach all day long, all week long, all year long on Luke 16 being a passage on hell and torments and destruction but can I say don't miss the Christ in the calamity don't miss the Savior in the sorrow but Tommy I've read this over and over again I don't find Jesus we're going to find him today okay I want us to look in our Bible and find for both the sinner and the saint there's a true person called Jesus Christ there's a true person called Jesus Christ you see every present ever present is the hope that reaches from a lofty heaven to a sin filled earth Ever present. The Bible says in Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 3 refers to Christ as the Lamb slain before the foundations of the earth. There is the truth that ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there was the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ there, a presence of and a saving grace to all men. Can I say this? Adam and Eve should have died in the garden. Oh, but God was there. And Noah and his family should have died in that place where the flood come to destroy the earth. But can I say, God was there. And may I say to you, not only them, but Mordecai and the whole Jewish nation should have died in Persia. But my friend, God was there. And for you and for I, we should have been dead in our sins and iniquities. But praise be unto God that Jesus Christ was there for you. And he's there today. Spanning a gap, if you will but accept him. We find here he is this true person called Jesus. I want you to see today the presence of Jesus Christ in the lives of these two men. And I want you to write three things down and we'll be done. I want us to see Jesus in this. Number one, I want you to see that there is a representative of Jesus. I want you to look in our text and find that there is a representative of Jesus. Christ is present in this world because he has or he lives in the life and through the life of others. What I say to mean by that is Christ is present because he is living in some people to show and be a witness, to be a representative, to be a reflection, to be an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I mean by that is this. I want you to understand that Christ was seen in the life of Moses as a leader. And before he was ever born, Christ was seen as a king in the life of David. And before he was ever born of a virgin in Bethlehem, Christ was seen as a warrior in the life of Samson. So what we find is that this, there are some people that you look into their life and you see Jesus Christ because they are a representative of Jesus Christ to you in that time. You know what? Jesus Christ is not here in the person, but I praise be unto God for some holy people who's lived some good lives that I might see him through them. I'm talking about a representative. Can I show you the representative for this rich man? Let me show you to him, okay? Look at verse number 20. The Bible says, And there was a certain beggar, a certain beggar named Lazarus. I want you to notice the faithfulness of the Lord. 